It is an enormous pleasure to welcome you here to the Scottish Parliament today. This is the start of our Festival of Politics and most of the theme this week is going to be about internationalism and looking outside. I am absolutely delighted that our very first speaker, uh, the lecture here today, is by Professor Sir Tom Devine. Here's my speech coming now. <laughs> okay, that helps me enormously. Uh, uh, because, of course, uh, Professor Sir Tom Devine um, is the leading authority on Scottish history. He is a graduate of the University of Strathclyde and he has had a truly stellar academic career. The Herald newspaper described him in 2014 as the nation's preeminent historian, a town and fearless intellect, an academic tornado from early in his career who has reshaped the way the Scottish past is viewed. Or as some of us, I'm sure many of us in here think, he is indeed a national treasure. Sir Thomas won numerous awards, fellowships, prizes and recognition of his scholarly and research achievements. And he is the author or editor of hundreds of articles and books and topics as diverse as immigration, urban history, the Scottish Highlands and the Irish in Scotland. We are delighted to have Sir Tom here today to talk about his recently edited book due for publication in October titled Recovering Scotland's Slavery Past, The Caribbean Connection, a book which challenges us in Scotland in our belief that Scotland had no significant involvement in slavery. Can I now ask you to join me in welcoming Sir Tom Devine to the stage. Um, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, for what I can only describe as a, an over-generous introduction, which I will not be able to live up to. Um, and also, can I um, say to you all today, I'm delighted that so many of you are able to come and, and listen to this presentation. Uh, it's the belief of myself and my colleagues who have been involved in this project that um, what we have to say about this aspect of the Scottish past is, is very important to our understanding of ourselves, as well as, of course, the numerous other aspects uh, of that past which have shaped us over the centuries as, as Scots. Uh, between the early 17th century and the end of the slave system in the British Empire in 1833, uh, ships of that empire uh, transported by coercion uh, 3.2 million Africans across the so-called Middle Passage uh, from their homelands uh, to a life of servitude and sometimes even an early death, including an early death on the voyage itself, to the North American colonies, uh, principally areas where tobacco, rice, uh, cotton was produced, and perhaps even more notoriously uh, to what became known uh, by the time of abolition as the graveyard of the slaves, uh, that is the West Indian Islands, the Caribbean, the Caribbean area, uh, which for reasons we might pick up during the presentation or in questions afterwards uh, or in discussion with my distinguished colleagues, um, had a regime uh, which ensured a very high level of mortality among those transported to those islands. The principal cultivation, of course, was sugar, rum, and molasses, and eventually, in the later 18th century, even more emphatically, uh, raw cotton. The system of slavery practice, ladies and gentlemen, was known as chattel slavery, um, which the translation, of course, is chattel is property. Uh, these individuals, therefore, these men and women, uh, and their children, eventually born over there, um, were regarded as commodities in the same way as the seats that you're sitting on today. They had no, well, at best, they had minimal rights. In practice, the rights were virtually non-existent. And that, of course, gave enormous possibilities for exploitation and degradation of people who were probably not regarded 
uh, by many of the master class, uh, the plantation owners, the merchants, the factors, uh, the bookkeepers, bookkeeper being a kind of euphemistic term uh, for overseers of the actual slave population uh, itself. Um, and the, the horrors of that experience have been to some extent described in the film, which I don't know if any of you have seen it or are going to see it later, um, about a slave experience in the United States. Uh, when you see that film, you need to understand uh, that the experience of degradation in some of these islands of the West Indies in the 18th and early 19th century was, was even worse, was even more acute. Uh, we need to keep in mind, of course, the fact that we cannot judge the past by 21st century criteria. Um, perhaps other people can do that, moralists, politicians, commentators. But the function of my trade is to try and understand the past, to try and, and investigate the past and understand why people behaved in the way they did, and taking into account the fact that until about the 1760s, 1770s, in the UK as a whole, there was hardly even a murmur, hardly any, even the smallest voice articulating, articulating opposition to what was at that time a conventional wisdom. That is the way that uh, the unfree regimes in the transatlantic colonies operated. That itself, of course, is a very intriguing historical question in its own right. Uh, why that kind of set of assumptions survived uh, for, for so long. Now, if we go to the Scottish dimension, uh, we end up with uh, a mixed picture. There has been much work done in Scottish historiography on aspects of the slave history, and particularly the history of the North American colonies and the the Caribbean zone that I referred to earlier. Uh, but it's an imbalanced history. It's an imbalanced set of historiographies. Uh, it's, uh, the imbalance is so acute until very, very recently that it's therefore a distorted vision of the Scottish connection uh, with uh, this aspect of European and indeed world history. And, and the, the distortion is because most of the material we have and the analysis that has come down to us, until I would say around about the year 2001, 2002, 2003, has focused virtually exclusively on the Scottish role in abolitionism. The Scottish role in abolitionism. Uh, and in fact, the Scottish record in abolitionism is a record to which this, of which this nation should be truly proud. With 10% of the British population circa 1800, normally in every year about a third of the anti-slavery petitions emanating from the UK came from, came from Scotland. And at the same time, we spawned several of the leading figures, many of them singularly charismatic figures, second only to William Wilberforce in the campaign against the so-called nefarious, the so nefarious trade. And one of the very important aspects of the Scottish role in relation to the abolitionist project was the intellectual one. You know, there were kind of two, there was a, a duality uh, which, broke down, which broke down the walls of prejudice, the walls supporting the slave trade and the slave economies. The first which was very important was religion and especially Protestant evangelicalism in the, in the um, 18th, late 18th and 19th centuries. Um, what is that? Okay. <laughs> I thought it, because I didn't think you were allowed to imbibe alcohol in this precinct. Um, the, the, um, the duality, the second aspect was the intellectual one, that the morality was okay 
but in order for a resounding victory for the anti-slavers, there also had to be the second one to demonstrate that at an intellectual level, a practical level, and an economic level, this horrible system had had its day. And again, we know uh, from the writings of a former boss of mine, the Vice Chancellor at Aberdeen University in his earlier days, Duncan Rice, that the philosoph of the Scottish Enlightenment were at the very heart of the project demonstrating the immorality of this uh, process, that these individuals who were enslaved were human beings, um, not commodities, and that every human being had a duty of benevolence to every other. And even Professor Adam Smith from the Chair of Moral Philosophy at the University of Glasgow illustrated quite convincingly that not only was this nefarious, not only was this a wickedness, but it was also stupid in economic terms because, he, as he acidly demonstrated, um, free labour in the long run was actually less costly than slave labour in terms of opportunity costs. The, the, um, the problem is, however, that the Scottish engagement with slavery, that darker side, has been quite effectively lost to history. In one of the chapters in the book that I have written, uh, I'm very intrigued by why this should be. Uh, I won't necessarily say more than that at this stage, except perhaps if there's, if there's time to wind up this lecture with a few comments about amnesia. Um, because as late as 2001, an authoritative overview of the Scottish past, the Oxford Compendium of Scottish History, published by Oxford University Press, had a few words to say about abolitionism and the trade to the Caribbean, but not even one paragraph about the Scottish role, the Scottish role in the trade or in the slave economies uh, themselves. Now, when we look back upon this historiographically, which is one of the things people in my business are interested in, we can see that that was the high watershed. That was, in a sense, the high noon of forgetfulness. Because from about 2002-03, although non-Scottish historians had already begun to explore this aspect, it was from about that time that Scottish scholars started to become interested and started, therefore, to produce a series of quite important articles over the period between that time and 2015. So, ladies and gentlemen, this project, Recovering the Scottish Past, which will be published as a volume by Edinburgh University Press in October, um, brought together virtually all of those scholars, not simply in Scotia, but elsewhere in the world, who had been at the cutting edge of this new dynamic, of this new exploration, of lifting the lid on something that was forgotten about. Forgotten about, I would say, from about the 1860s, 1870s onwards until the end of the last, the last millennium. But what is distinctive, truly distinctive, about the Scottish aspect? Because France, Portugal, the Low Countries, and Spain, and of course England, also went through a process of deep amnesia. What is distinctive about the Scottish experience is two things. One, how late it was before we actually started to work on this and discover the realities hidden from history. I mean, from the 1940s, 1950s, English historians were at work uh, in a very effective way examining various aspects of their nation's connection to the slave business. And one reason why the quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary flourishing of commemoration at the time of 2007, which was the anniversary of the abolition of the trade itself in 1807, BBC programmes, school courses, hundreds of lectures and events, and up here, something but very little. Um, one distinguished literateur of Canadian, one, one distinguished literateur, poet and dramatist, 
of Nigerian and Scottish origin in a, in a, in a feature in the Guardian newspaper that year it commented on how minuscule was the Scottish coverage. Although at the same time, as I've said before, scholars were now beginning to move into the territory, but in terms of popular usage, that was not necessarily a popular knowledge. That was still by no means the case. And the second aspect of the Scottish one, which is fantastically intriguing from my point of view as an historian, and why it should be, is not simply amnesia, is not simply amnesia, but denial. Denial. In the 1860s, quite bizarrely, ironically, but also brazenly, the Glasgow Herald newspaper produced a statement from the Glasgow West India Association. The Glasgow West India Association being, of course, in the early 19th century, a pressure group for Caribbean merchants and plantation owners, and a very effective organ of anti-abolition at that time. In its later incarnation in that period in the later 19th century, it stated triumphantly that Glasgow had in no part in this wicked business. It pointed out that virtually every stone, virtually every stone in all thoroughfares of Liverpool were covered in the blood of slaves, but not so on Clydeside. And whether as overtly and brazenly as that, or simply unconsciously in terms of assumption, that has lived on, that's, that, that assumption of the negligible or very, very limited Scottish role um, in the slave business has lived on over many, over many generations. When seriously important histories of Scotland started to appear in the, from the 1960s onwards, led by great scholars such as Bill Ferguson and Christopher Schmout. If you look at their indexes, there's no run reference to S-L-A-V-E or slave trade or whatever. In my own first book in 1975, equally myopic, it was essentially a social and business study of the great merchant community of Glasgow and it's particularly its trading activity to the North American tobacco colonies called the Tobacco Lords, um, there's a few references to slavery. There's even in the paperback edition images of slaves loading tobacco, but no real investigation of the, excuse me, the human horrors that lay, that lay behind that. That wasn't because the information wasn't there. It was just because at that time scholars had a different focus had a different emphasis. And it's only when the emphasis changed that, for example, I was able to go back to my earlier work carried out as a, a young 14-year-old in the uh, early 70s uh, and, uh, and, uh, and revi revise it. So what I'm going to do now for the, the rest of the presentation is to um, set a context for the discussion which will follow after I've finished by giving you some of the key findings uh, of this book. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to buy it because it's, um, although I'll have to share the booty uh, with the other authors since it is a, an edited volume um, I always say that uh, although uh, we, are not, um, uh, we are not down at heel and my immediate children are okay there's always the problem of those wee grandchildren you know all my royalties always go to them um, to help them along the passage of life. Aged from two years to 12, there are eight of them, and they require serious support. Um, but the problem is, you won't actually be able to buy this until October. But given the demand that there'll be for it, you need to get your orders in very quickly. Okay? I've tried my best, guys. So, um, okay, the first thing is this. Um, and this, in a sense, was... A, was uh, to give support almost uh, to, those, to, if you like, the deniers. Uh, we now know that between the later 17th century and the 1760s, only about 4,300 slaves were actually transported from Africa by ships sailing directly from Scottish ports. Uh, 27, perhaps 30 voyages in all. Maybe 
in the future slightly increased. But that's a drop, a horrible phrase to use, a drop in the ocean compared to the 3.2 million. And that absence of a direct slaving connection gave an historical basis, in my view, to much of the amnesia and also to much of the, much of the denial which underpinned this subject area uh, for so long. Uh, but what happened was this. This was not, this lack of direct connection was nothing to do with moral scruple. What it was to do with, as the great Jack Price, now unfortunately no longer with us, he died several years, uh, he died uh, earlier this year, a professor of history at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, uh, and the great historian of the tobacco business um, from uh, Europe to the, um, uh, from the, the Americas rather, to Europe. As Price pointed out, as long ago as 1964, the reasons why the Glaswegians did not participate to any extent in direct slave trading was because Liverpool, Bristol, and to a significant extent London were already entrenched within it. And to cut a very long story short, if you study the history of Scottish traders in Europe, they always went for the soft underbelly. One of their vade mecum was always to avoid areas of intense competition and go to areas which were opening up, which were relatively virgin territory. And, I, and it's, 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 my, it's my own view that this functionality, this specialization of function in the West Coast ports with Bristol and Liverpool and sugar and slaving down at least until the 1770s, the outbreak of the American War, and Glasgow eventually moving in great strength into the tobacco business, that that explains it. It's a set of economic criteria and influences. It's not necessarily in any sense, as we'll see as the lecture goes on, of concern with the inhumanity uh, of, of the... Of the, of the uh, uh, the commerce in question. So, uh, then the book demonstrates that in response to the Liverpool, Bristol, London hegemony in the actual transportation of the unfree, the Scots react in this way. One, they migrate, or at least some Scottish traders and professionals migrate to the slaving ports. Um, we know that in London, by about uh, 1770, 1780, something like 15 to 20 percent of those merchants active in the slave business were first-generation Scots. We also know from the recent work, uh, marvellous work in fact, published by the Un University College London team, uh, Recently, recently described on the, on, the, um, on the TV on compensation data when um, owners of slaves were compensated for their, quote, property uh, after 1833 when the slave system was abolished. We also know from those data that of the ten biggest syndicates by that stage, that is the early 1830s, it's a kind of snapshot, the ten biggest syndicates Three to four of them were either run by Scottish merchants or were originally founded by traders from north of the border, traders from this country. Even more intriguingly, uh, one particular port, which was the epicenter not simply of the British trade, but of the European trade, that is Liverpool. Liverpool was, if you like, the centre of the British imperial slave trade in the 18th and early 19th centuries, that if you, if, if you examine, as some of the colleagues in the book did, the professional input into the Liverpool slave trade, then the Scottish presence is notable. Uh, for instance, of the skippers, of, of the skippers of, um, or masters of slaving ships at the high noon of, sh of slavery, round about 1800, one-fifth were first-generation Scots, mainly from southwest Scotland and the borders, and about 20% of the surgeons, because this country, perhaps even to this day, still does it. But certainly in the 18th century, the enormous oversupply of trained physicians. In almost every imperial territory I've looked at in the last several years, 
Scottish physicians were overrepresented and they were very much involved therefore especially during the period when slavers wished to reduce the mortality on board and also when in the Caribbean particularly plantation owners wished to move away exclusively from the habit of buying what were called salt water blacks that is straight off the ship and trying to produce if you like new generations within the enslaved population uh, of the islands and for that they require medical input and it's very intriguing also that many of the, the, the doctors who have been, uh, whose life history have been examined in the, the West Indies eventually moved from, um, eventually moved from um, medicine into plantation ownership with the profits they had made in that previous profession and also into slaving directly uh, from, the, from West Africa. Uh, so that's the first thing, migration not necessarily occurring in Scotland, but people moving to take advantage of these opportunities in areas where there were already established networks of the business. It's the classic Scottish performance in the 17th and 18th and early 19th centuries of penetration by stealth. You know, at Darien, uh, this is the, way the, the symbol I have in mind, the Darien disaster represented if you like, a stupid attempt to knock down the front door of the English Empire. The Scots learned very, very quickly that bitter lesson and decided to go in the back door and sometimes even through the back windows to burglarize the, uh, the rich pastures of what was before 1707, exclusively the English, the English Empire. So you find then in the um, period of adaptation to this, and probably starting round about the mid-17th century, according to one chapter in the book, you begin to see Scottish merchants, uh, plantation owners, um, managers, uh, colonial officials, physicians, accountants, and what were called attorneys, that's, that's West Indian, uh, that's West Indian uh, language for managers, not necessarily lawyers but managers of the estates which were usually held by absentees. You begin to see a, a movement which peaks after 1750, after 1760. And the reason for that is during the Seven Years' War and then the Napoleonic Wars, a whole variety of new Caribbean islands and areas in South America come under British rule and the Scots are the first to move in. They were already beginning to ensconce themselves in Jamaica and then it's into the Leeward Islands or the Cedar Islands sometimes referred to and then finally the last bastion of the slave business into Demerara, Demerara and Berbice on the northeastern part of the South American continent now known today as British Guyana. Um, the, the one figure that comes to mind is again 10% of the British population a third of the population, the white population of Jamaica in the 1760s uh, were Scots. And, you know, the, the number of Scottish names, I mean, it almost makes you think that this is a Campbell empire because of the number of names, uh, the, the number of names you come across in the material uh, with that, that name there. Because, again, as of old, this was what I, what I referred to in my work, neo-clanship that clanship had been dead from the mid-18th century, but it was reincarnated as, a, as commercial corporations, whereby families, not simply in the Highlands, but elsewhere, created these vast dominions, these huge intercontinental dynasties uh, of Scottish influence. Uh, everywhere from Southeast Asia, eventually China and Japan, through India, Australasia, New Zealand, South Africa, back to the original colonies across the Atlantic uh, in the Caribbean and in the, tobacco, in the tobacco colonies. I mean, it's an extraordinary story for a nation that in the, at the high point of this development, which is probably just before the, probably just after rather, the First World War in terms of the coverage of red on the, the, the global map, 
uh, which are just less than round about 4 million people. And it was at the centre of this concentration of power of 700 million people across the globe. So, so, so the functionaries of empire were uh, very obviously in there. And the third piece of information which demonstrates the extent of it is the compensation information that I referred to earlier. Many of you may have seen, as I said, the programmes which revealed in one sentence a truth about the Scottish reality, and that truth was 10% of the compensation, 10 of the population of the country, UK at that time, were born in this country. But 15 to 17% of the claims came from this country. In other words, the disproportionate role in terms of slave ownership. And if you look, as you can look online uh, today, anyone could look online for that information. Um, you can see the extent to which you would have, for example, a single widow living in Stirling owning two slaves to very high profile business organizations um, uh, owning several hundred uh, in, in, that, in that period. And I mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier on, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that the reality is that the Scottish nation played a significant part in abolitionism. That is also part of the tapestry of our history. But equally, an unknown until the last few years was anti-abolitionism. That is, petitions against the end of slavery. And what as in England, these petitions mainly came, perhaps you would think naturally and predictably, from the great slaving ports of Bristol, Liverpool and London. In Scotland, they were spread across the country. Um, right from the Western Highlands and Islands, if you examine the role of the Highlander, the, whole, the role of the Gale in this business, it adds a further complication to the history of the Gale as victim. Um, and of course, the, the Gale as victim is an aspect of the history of Galedom. But as more and more scholarship begins to come through, it's a more complicated and complex story uh, than that, not least when you see the role of evicted Highlanders in New South Wales in relation to Aboriginal peoples in the early to mid-19th century. Uh, so the, the, um, uh, I think we can say, I think we can say after the project was completed, with really very little in the way of equivocation or ambiguity, that Scotland was at least involved in this project, in this business, as was England. But the most controversial aspect, and my, my colleagues are not responsible for this, but in the conclusion which I wrote, I raised the question, when you look at the statistical evidence, is it possible that of the four home countries, Scotland was most involved? Because certainly the evidence is clear on Ireland and Wales, was very limited, a very limited aspect to it. The one thing, the one area particularly where there could be an argument that the impact on Scotland was more powerful than the impact on England is the last area I want to look at now, the issue of the effect, the effect of um, this aspect of our history on Scottish development, or what we might term the Scottish economic miracle. You see, Scotland did experience a true industrialisation unlike England, whose movement towards industrialization and revolution was evolutionary. Many historians have tried to link the slave business with the capital and the markets for English industrialization. Their arguments have, to this, day, to this date, not been entirely convincing or well and universally received. The reasons for that are twofold. A, England was a rich society. It didn't really require the externalities of more capital supply from the colonial businesses. And secondly, as I've said, it was very much a process of long-term development in uh, south of the border. 
whereas the Scottish Industrial Revolution was cataclysmic. Cataclysmic in the sense that not until forced Soviet industrialization in the late 1920s, early 1930s, was there another example, and that was coerced by the state, was there another example of an industrialization process of such speed? The, the, way, the best way to see this is the extraordinary fact that one in ten Scots in the 1760s lived in towns or cities that are above 5,000. As early as the, 19, the 1820s, it was one in three. By the 1850s, it was 60% of the population. You know that sandwich of light that you see from outer space in lowland Scotland? Darkness to the north because of the prism of where the photographs are taken. Darkness to the south. The sandwich of light at night between the Forth and the Clyde. Only other three such concentrations of light in the whole of Western Europe. One, the, um, the Ruhr arching into the Paris Basin. And in England, the black country, although of course at night is very much the light country because of the concentration of urbanism. That process in Scotland was an historical process. It wasn't always like that. It occurred between 1750 and 1850. And so the question begs itself, where did the capital resources in such a poor country come, not simply for the industrial dynamic, but also because at the same time, the infrastructures of the new society had to be built. And unlike England, an agricultural revolution occurring at the same time. You see these tidy fields surrounded by hedgerows. All right, the roads are tarmacadam now. The, the, the farmhouses, many of them date to this period. The rectangular fields. That was the remaking of the Scottish landscape between the 1760s and the 1820s. And apart from the motor cars and the telegraph wires, etc., those structures would have been recognisable to a person in the 1840s, but they would not have been recognisable to a Scot living in the 1730s. So my point is this. There might be much more potential in investigating the relationship between the slave colonies and Scottish industrialism than there is in England. And here are three or four ways in which that connection, as I argue in one of the chapters called, Did Slavery Make Scotia Great? One, in the first textile-based phase of the Scottish Industrial Revolution, almost all the Sea Island raw cotton came from the Caribbean. Two, Scotland was engaged in not simply one, but two of the slave-based colonies of the 18th century, the tobacco business, by, the, by 1775, 47 million pounds of tobacco coming into the Clyde ports. By far the biggest tobacco emporium in the whole of Western Europe. Bigger than all of England and its outports combined. And then from the middle decades of the 18th century, and especially after the American War of Independence, sugar. By, by 1815, at the end of the Napoleonic War, 64% of Scottish trade was done with the Caribbean. So these were the two pillars of external trade, tobacco up to the 1770s, sugar, and to some extent cotton thereafter. Both of them impossible without the unfree, without the armies of unfree men and women who worked in the Caribbean and North American plantations. And then third, the capitalization process of those who had made money in these activities Second only to, North, to Eastern, uh, sorry, second only to Indian nabobs in the returning wealth, buying estates, 1770 to 1815, about something like 64.3% of Glasgow merchants in that period in the tobacco and West Indies business had at least one industrial investment. I've counted between 80 and 90 of them in the West, uh, in the West Central area, which of course was the a heartland of Scottish industrialism. And then in the eastern lowlands, the many thousands of linen weavers who produced slave cloth, slave cloth uh, for those islands uh, across, across the Atlantic Ocean. So with two minutes to go, the, um, the wind up of this exposition. Two things to say. One, this project and the book in which it's involved is a pioneering volume. 
It is not intended to be and cannot be the final word on a subject. But it's an attempt to, if you like, bring together uh, work done on material which has, which, which has so far appeared in learned articles uh, into a coherent volume to act as, if you like, a, um, a basis uh, for future inquiry and written in a way which is accessible. That's the important thing. This, this is such an important area, probably in terms of discovery, the most important, certainly the most shocking I've ever, become, I've ever been involved as, in, as an historian, that it needs to be got out there. People need to find out about it. But it's, as I say, it's not definitive yet. And the third thing, the third thing is this. Sorry, the second thing is this. Um, for those who may find these territories troubling, it seems to me, especially speaking in this uh, historic chamber, it seems to me that Scotland, now by any standard, a mature and argumentative democracy, uh, can face its past in its various shades, uh, from the very light to the very dark. Because to do otherwise is actually to betray the past. It's actually, in a sense, how would one put it? It's actually, in a sense, to distort, to distort the reality. And there's nothing wrong with mythology because many human beliefs are mythical. But some are more mythical than others. This is a story that needs to be known. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much indeed, and uh, can I say I find that fascinating. We've all got a chance to discuss, um, and we'll leave some time in hand for uh, you to ask questions too. Um, as Sir Tom said, recovering Scotland's slavery past is not available right now. It's not going to be there till October. Um, but after this session, uh, Sir Tom will be signing some of his previous books, downstairs in the garden lobby and as a grandma I am mindful of his grandchildren um, so please join us and buy and he will sign for you um, joining us to take part in the discussion are three very distinguished people who have a great interest in this subject too firstly Professor Sir Jeff Palmer OBE is an international renowned brewing expert who received a knighthood in recognition of his services to human rights, science and charity. He is also a prominent anti-racism campaigner. Professor Palmer is currently writing a book on the consequences of slavery called The Enlightenment, Power and the Powerless. Louise Welsh is a writer living and working in Glasgow. She is the author of six novels, has produced many short stories and articles and written for radio and the stage. Her books include The Cutting Room, for which she was nominated for the Orange Prize for Fiction and has won numerous awards, including the Salter Society Scottish First Book of the Year Award. In 2014, she was a collaborator on the Empire Cafe 2014 Commonwealth Games project, which explores Scotland's relationship with the North Atlantic slave trade and include, for example, music, poetry, academic lectures and historical walks. Our final guest is Stephen Mullen, who was appointed as a postdoctoral research associate in history at the University of Glasgow in January 2015, working on the project Runaway Slaves in Britain, Bondage, Freedom and Race in the 18th Century. His research is focused on the historical connections between Scotland and Caribbean slavery, with a particular interest in Glasgow West India merchants, planters in the 18th and 19th centuries. In 2009, Stephen published a general text on the theme, It Was Ne Us. So I think that's probably quite a good place to start our discussion. Could you join us?
Thanks very much. Could we maybe just start by asking each of you to say briefly um, a few words about Sir Tom's lecture? Sir Geoffrey. Kindly, I hope. Yeah, yeah, you've got to be nice. You've got to be nice. Yeah. Is everybody nice in this chamber? No, they're not. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, Tom, I, I think, gave a pretty um, accurate um, description of um, what we now call um, the a history of enlightenment, I should call it, because what Sir Tom was trying to say, and I shall just give a few examples, and I, I, I was brought up in a biblical tr um, a, a tradition, and therefore stories or examples tend to stick longer with people than a general um, uh, 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 um, discussion. And if we start very close to where we are, and I've given many lectures in Scotland, and you can go nowhere in Scotland where you will not be near the history that Tom is talking about. And if we just leave from this um, building and go up the road to St. Andrew's Square, then we've got Henry Dundas. And Henry Dundas stopped Wilberforce from abolishing the slave trade for 15 years. If we go to Glasgow and look at the Gallery of Modern Art, the Gallery of Modern Art is a slave master's house. If we go to Ayrshire in, in Oakencrove, Oakencrove is the house of Richard Oswald of Oswald Street in Glasgow. His wife, Burns, refers to her in his poem, Ode Sacred to the Memory of Mrs. Oswald of Oakencrove. And he said she was on £10,000 annuity a year, and he hoped she never gets out of perdition. If we take Richard Oswald, just to, to talk about what Tom was saying, it wasn't just about money, it was about power. If we take Richard Oswald of Oswald Street, he, in fact, is the son of the, the, the uh, of his father was a minister. He went to Jamaica, and he and Grant of the Grant clan bought an island called Barnes Island outside Sierra Leone, and from that island they shipped slaves to the Caribbean. He became one of the most powerful men in the world, so that when the American Revolution was being discussed, Oswald was Britain's representative, and he decided to keep Canada rather than, than give it to the United States. So that's the sort of power slave, Scottish slave masters had, and therefore, um, what Tom was talking about is not just about money, it's about power and it's about, most importantly, I feel, the Scottish black diaspora, which in fact um, dominates the Caribbean in terms of politics, wealth, etc. So thank you very much. I hope that gives a flavour of what I think Tom was trying to say. Louise. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know, the audience probably couldn't see, but uh, Professor Devine, had, you had no notes there at all. It was very impressive to watch you speaking with no notes, no auto cue, and uh, I really found it a very useful lecture. I guess as a, a writer, um, I'm not restricted by the rigor that historians have to, to inhabit, and I think um, writers and visual artists and filmmakers we tend to be, I don't know, we, we tend to leech, I think, on historians and your rigorous research. But I think we can also add something to the discussion and to the debate because um, the voices that are missing from the history are, of course, the, the voices of um, the enslaved people. We've lost those voices. And I think it is also important to remember when we talk about the people who are taken from Africa that they didn't go quietly that there were lots and lots of rebellions and many people, of course, committed suicide rather than be enslaved. And I think one of the things that, uh, that I find interesting also about the, the discussion of our history are the voices of um, individuals like uh, Frederick Douglass, who came to Scotland many times and to other parts of um, Britain and who um, contributed to the abolitionism uh, debate, who freed himself and who helped to free other people. And I think within Scottish art and literature, we, we begin to see um, that desire to try and draw in some of the, the, 
The Lost Voices. You mentioned Jackie Kay's play, fantastic play, Lamplighter, um, which was restaged last year. And of course, there's James Robertson's Joseph Knight, uh, the artist Graham Fagan's um, collaboration with Ghetto Priest on the Slaves' Lament, which may or may not have been written by Burns. Um, but Professor Devine started off by saying that, uh, that we need to see this history in order to see ourselves, and I think that's hugely important. We cannot know ourselves without knowing our history, but perhaps to use Burns again, we have to see ourselves as others see us. And this may be a history that we did not get in school, but it's not a secret history. And when other people come perhaps to the National Museum of Scotland and look at the uh, display that they have on the tobacco merchants and read the little um, thing that says tobacco was a good news story for Scotland, they may wonder what we're talking about because it wasn't a good news story for everyone. I guess I'm also interested in the impact that it has on the contemporary period because, of course, the people who were compensated for slaves um, now I think the, the idea of land reform and who owns land in Scotland is directly connected to this experience as well. Stephen. Okay, um, I, I thought the lecture was um, very good, as always, Professor Devine. Um, I need to declare an interest. Uh, I have a chapter in the book, so you know I think it's an awesome collection, so, <laughs> so buy it, please. Um, <laughs> my own chapter is, is a case study of a, a Glasgow West India merchant firm, John Campbell Senior & Co., uh, but, of course, you know, this is a very timely account. Why has there been no collection uh, of this type before about Scotland's role in the slave trade and slavery? So it's pioneering uh, and also very timely. And it's entirely appropriate that a historian of Sir Tom Devine's magnitude uh, edits it. So, so thank you very much for allowing me to, to share my views in the collection. What this book does, it peels away the myths surrounding Scots and their involvement in New World slavery. Now we know that not just were we abolitionists, uh, um, you know, were philosophical critics of slavery, we also had a disproportionate role uh, across the New World. So this book does that. And of course, the compensation money is one way we can quantify this disproportionate involvement. So there's numerous, there's other studies in the book as well, and as Tom's alluded to in the lecture, you know, this, this was a, a great wealth income. You know, Scotland, a, a, a really formative time in its history, was accumulating large capital you know, that was, was, you know, getting put into industrialisation, uh, commerce. So this is the, the big question for me as, as an economic and social historian of, of Glasgow West India merchants, these planters, the sojourners, the temporary economic migrants. We should really be thinking about how far this capital that was generated through the expropriation of labour, you know, based on what can only be termed a, a genocide, you know, slaver, the slave trade and slavery was a genocide. Let's, let's not be about the bush. So when a historian of Tom Devine's magnitude says that the impact was more powerful in Scotland than England, Wales or Ireland, we need to listen. So from after this book, uh, after the project, you know, and it leads to more, does it then become accepted wisdom that Scottish capitalism and Scottish industrialisation was driven by New World slavery? Okay, thanks very much. Um, can, can I just maybe start off the discussion, uh, Sir Tom? I mean, you said that, you know, it's taking us so long in Scotland to acknowledge our own history mm. with slavery. You quoted the Glasgow Herald that, you know, surprised me enormously well, about... the. Yep. Called then the Glasgow Herald, as, yeah. you, know, as you know, yeah. Patricia. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the Glasgow Herald. Was it denial? Was it shame? Um, did they recognise that the slaves were anything other than commodities? And has the failure of us to recognise that history got something to do with the lack of teaching of that history in school itself? Mm. Um, in the same way that my generation you know, did not get our own Scottish history of our own country. Yeah. And, you know, you're going to do a fantastic lecture next week about Thomas Muir, one of my yep. heroes. Mm. Um, I was never taught Thomas Muir at school. Um, and I just wonder, is, you know, the failure to acknowledge a role in the slave trade, um, 
got as much to do with the failure to teach any of her own Scottish history? Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's a powerful question, uh, Tricia, because, you know, in a sense, the, um, uh, you could start a, and give another lecture on this. And in fact, in uh, November, I've got the honour to be given, um, I was thinking at the beginning something had happened I hadn't found out about, but I'm giving the T.C. Smout lecture at uh, St. Andrews University, a place I usually avoid. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the great Christopher Smout. And in fact, that lecture is actually on that question. It's called Lost to History. Uh, so without taking too much time up, basically, um, and to take one of the causes, because it's multiple, multiple in, in, in why, why this has been forgotten, but one of, them, one of them definitely is our knowledge of the Scottish past and our instruction of the Scottish past. This, in a sense, is probably the most extreme example of the ignorance. Um, just, to, just, just, just to explain that, it is an extraordinary thing to, de to, to reflect upon the fact that as late as 1959, there were only five historians in the Scottish universities teaching modern history and doing some research on it. Professor John Hargreaves of Aberdeen University, recently dead, said in his inaugural, he's an Englishman, or was an Englishman, the history of Yorkshire is better known and more studied than the history of modern Scotland. So there were two culprits in this. One of the culprits were the universities, because really, I mean, my, my career, because I started teaching in universities in 1969, my career has seen the transformation, because that transformation dates from the 1960s. And the problem was that inevitably my colleagues would go for the domestic history of Scotland. Mm. Um, the first book published on the imperial relationship between Scotland and the British Empire from 1937 until today was published as late as 2000. So it's not that my colleagues, and I include myself in this, were in any, se any sense avoiding the realities. We just didn't know. And you only begin to see the movement outwards, the study of diaspora, the study of empire, which automatically leads to this subject area sooner, sooner rather than later, which has only really begun since the late 1990s and is now one of the most flourishing aspects of the past. Now, as far as the schools are concerned, as some of you may know, because um, I've said it so often, I gave up history at second year in the senior secondary school. That was the school that you went to if you were fortunate enough to pass 11 plus. They no longer exist, of course. And uh, because it was so utterly boring. And I took geography. Now, geography is actually quite a pleasant subject, stimulating at school level. But it doesn't have the intellectual challenge of the queen of all disciplines, in my view, at university level. Right? And so I, was, I, I, I found myself... Uh, being taught by some of the most able research historians at the period of that renaissance, almost all of them English, working on Scotland's economic history. Remember those great names, Stephen? You probably do. Oh, although, you, although you weren't there at the time, you'd probably remember who they were. Fred okay. Exactly. Um, uh, they, they were so committed to research before the research assessment exercise that they even gave prizes at the end of the year, you know, metaphorically, like King of the Second Resources, KSS, that is somebody who was not actually looking at original material. I regularly won the prize in the early 70s, um, the um, Thomas Malthus Prize for overproduction. But this was not because of my many writings, it was because we had five children under the age of six. Um, uh, two of them were twins, by the way. So it's, is that okay? That's okay. Okay, right. So anyway, the... the um, uh, so that the universities being like that, the schools teaching in a very boring way, almost everybody in my generation, and I'm now almost senile, um, almost everybody in that generation is the same thing to say. One of the most boring subjects at school, and now again there's been a radical transformation. 
Um, and it's just a matter of time. It's already happening. I know some people are doing it. It's just a matter of time because before this becomes almost core or deja vu, Tricia, in terms of the school curriculum. Um, because the other thing is, it's a horrible thing to say this, but one of the things that fascinates pupils at school is violence. You know, I remember listening to one of my colleagues in the British Academy uh, giving a lecture in London. Why are people fascinated by the Nazi past? You know, and there is something in us. And one of the horrible things about this topic is it's got that intrinsic interest and it will appeal, um, it will appeal uh, to, uh, to future generations of Scottish school children to study why this happened, why it was allowed to, allowed to go on for so long and what effect, if any, did it have in their country. But, but there's a whole variety of other reasons why the forgetfulness set, set in. Yeah. Stephen. Um, yes, yeah, certainly there, there's been, Tom alludes to, you know, the, the, the outright denial in the Glasgow Herald, but also you, what you see in some of the contemporary 19th century um, publications, though country houses, though Glasgow Gentry, for yeah. example, these are, he's written by he's an inheritor of a slave fortune. The guy who's writing it is connected with the Smiths of Jordan Hill. He's describing the other slave owners as they are. But he's using glorious euphemisms, West India landowner, West India estate owner. You know, so these glorious euphemisms have, have then fed into well, Oxford, Dictionary, Oxford Dictionary National Biography, for example. There's very little mention of slavery in these biographies. Just, just as a footnote, Stephen, just to emphasise the point, late 19th century Glasgow, mm -hmm. these figures were described as heroic, yep. as the people who established the second city in the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, this is, this is a heroic history, so it's written for that, for that perspective, you know. So, um, essentially, I mean, we know that Scots had limited involvement in the direct trade in slaves, um, but where they had found their niche was the trade with the plantations. So, from an economic perspective, this was essentially a business relationship where the capital was flowing back. So, this money has seeped into, you know, industry, banks, insurance, shipping, so it's been easy to launder the money, I feel like. So historians, I mean, Tom's acknowledged that, you know, historians, there's, there has been a collective failure, um, but certainly we're, we're up to our game now, uh, and, and we're working on it. But also we need to acknowledge the, the means uh, and methods that the academic research percolates into society. There has been a failure there as well, uh, and in particular museums. The National Museum of Scotland has, has no mention of the Caribbean, I'm reliably informed. Glasgow, for example, um, is the only transatlantic port city that had connections with Caribbean slavery. The others, of course, being Bristol, London and Liverpool. It doesn't have a permanent exhibition and it's in the city's museums or it doesn't have a plaque. I know the Kelvin Grove Museum, for example, they're leading the way. We've just they're moving, they're moving, but they've not yet moved. We've, yeah. Well, we've, we've, there's a collaborative PhD with the University yes, of Glasgow. Yes, I, I, I know that. I'm talking about the displays. Display. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, the research is underway in collections yeah. and stuff, so moves are afoot, you know. Uh, but I think Scots as well, you know, we, we seem to revel in this hero or victim history. Mm. We like to think about Burns, David Livingston, best wee country in the world, and all that. We John give, Preble. John Preble, well, Prebleism coming into the, the, the victim, the victimology, this historiographical victimology. You know, we prefer to concentrate on the role of Scots as victims, the subjugated province of England, you know, Glencoe, Culloden, uh, Darien, disaster, you know, and I think it's just been harder for, for Scots to accept, you know, the more unpalatable aspects of our history, you know, but now we know we had a deep and very powerful and pervasive influence across the new world and involvement. Uh, and plantation slavery. Please, anything you want to? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that Tom and Stephen have put it very well. I think um, basically there's a degree to which it doesn't fit with the national story, mm. the image that we have of ourselves. Mm. But I would say that Scottish people have always been enthusiastic self-educators. Um, many of us didn't get, didn't get history in school, and then people go and they seek out books, they go to the library, they buy all of this stuff. I think there is a passion for education and there's a passion to know about the past and when these books exist and when the documentaries are on the television, people are very keen to find out about it and I feel that actually often in a sense the general population 
is ahead of the establishment on this. Sometimes I feel the I don't know what I mean by the establishment, but you know, them. <laughs> the, uh, there's an idea that the establishment feel perhaps that the rest of us are not quite ready for this information, would be a bit squeamish about it. Actually, I think we're hungry for it and we want to know more about it. And it's not about beating yourself up and getting ashamed. It's about knowing our past so we can know ourselves. Can I just give a short anecdote about this, if the President of will allow me, because it's very, it's very re relevant. The first thing is that in relation to what you said, Louise, the paradox of the failure to transmit an understanding of the Scottish past in an acceptable way at schools for my generation and for the generations before is this hunger. This is why there's the hunger. Because people were denied their national story, their national narrative. Although I would say, you know, as a, as a bookseller in the past, I would say that we have a hunger for other subjects oh, yes, as well, so philosophy and that, all of these things. I was just putting that, that point in as an, an additionality. But the main thing I wanted to tell the audience was the story of the failed attempt to tell the Scottish people about all this in 2007. Because two of my colleagues, ironically enough, in the book, okay, Eric and Ian, were hired by, this is before um, the Scottish Government, this was the Scottish Executive. So there's no blame, <laughs> there's no blame on you or yours. <laughs> I just blame everybody equally. Okay, right. So, so, so the thing is this, that they were hired to write um, a descriptor for the anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade with specific reference to the Scottish factor. The bureaucrats, if I can call them that, in the Scottish executive at that stage, not the politicians, the bureaucrats, thought it was too heavy, thought it was too, you know, it was really, really heavy stuff and, you know, people don't know about this. And not only did they bowdlerise it to the extent that both scholars resigned, but it was then delegated to an English, not an English historian, an English writer to write up. And that, that, that um, pamphlet still exists to this day. Mm. And if you compare it with some of the things that we've all been saying this evening to that expurgated volume, it's not even a volume, it's a small pamphlet, then that, that makes the point about Louise's concern or her, her, her argument that there was almost, you know, people shouldn't really be, be we shouldn't really be talking about this. It's a bit too dark and maybe a bit too destabilizing. Geoffrey. Um, I, I think the, um, Tom's view and um, uh, my colleagues there, I, I would say that to me it somehow seemed that we had no historians in Scotland with any voice before 2007. <laughs> and somehow if we had historians, you don't need historians that the history is all around us. You walk past it every day. Robert Burns writes about it. I mean, Robert Burns bought his ticket to go to Jamaica in 1786. And he says so himself to be a slave master at 30 pounds a year. We even knew his salary. And somehow, if we are interested in Burns, and we don't seem to have a clue <laughs> about that he wanted to go to the Caribbean, he wrote The Slave's Lament, which is the main focus at the moment, we got reggae artists in Jamaica recording it. The point is that he wrote Old Sacred to, to the Memory of Mrs. Oswald of Auchincroof, and it is probably his most vitriolic poem. And in that poem, he cites Richard Oswald's wife, as I said before. And he was probably one of the, he negotiated the American settlement, and I'll repeat that. That was the power of the slave master. And if he's not in the book, you better put him. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's definitely, he's definitely yeah. <laughs> And to me, um, if we look at Scotland land ownership today, you type in who owns the land, and I can assure you three or four of the most senior families in Scotland will be mentioned. They'd be the Grants, the Weatherburns, the Baileys from Inverness, or, in fact, um, the, the Clarks or the whatever. The fact is that the land ownership today is in the ownership of these families still. In fact, when I wrote my little book on the Enlightenment, I had a phone call from Lord Grant of Speyside. And I didn't know I, I lived in Pennycook. <laughs> and the voice said, um, Geoffrey, I have a bone to pick with you. I've seen your little book. But he says, I'm terribly busy. I'll get Adrian to speak to you. <laughs> 
So Adrian comes on the phone and Adrian says, my Lord has read your little book and what he wants to point out is that the Grants treated their slaves better than the, <laughs> than the Sterlings of Kerr did theirs. <laughs> so what you have is a history and it is that funny, some of it, because it, it seems so ridiculous. And when you leave this building, if you go to, 20, to Fort Street, which is at the, down from John Lewis, and if you want to see this history, what we're talking about, go along to Fort Street, stand at 24. 24 Fort Street is on the compensation list. 24 Fort Street was there in 1833. Look at the house, 26, and look at 22. 24 is the only house on Fort Street with a balcony. <laughs> a wrought iron balcony. It was owned by a person who owned slaves. They only owned 30 slaves, but it made that difference. So with the Weatherbunds and the Grants and the Campbells who owned thousands, that was, you can measure the economy in that sense. And therefore, I won't want to conclude on a, a, a negative note because if you look at your brochure it's how we see things the brochure you're handed out with from for this event in fact my wife looked at it and she said it's saying exactly what you were saying Jeff she says what the brochure says Scotland was involved in abolition but at the beginning of slavery they were involved in slavery itself the Scots were involved throughout the whole thing <laughs> Writing it that way is repeating the omission. And we are doing it in the brochure you were given today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Louise, I want to direct this question okay. to you. Um, the Empire Cafe project in Commonwealth Games 2014. Um, how successful do you think that was in introducing people to the history of slavery and the involvement of Glasgow? Um, the Empire Cafe project, which I directed with um, my colleague Jude Barber of Collective Architecture, was a multidisciplinary um, exploration of Scotland's relationship with the North Atlantic slave trade, and everybody on the panel contributed towards it because, of course, I'm a writer of fiction, I'm not a historian, and we could only do it with the, the help of historians. Uh, Stephen Mullen was our, our, special, he was our special historian, uh, historic advisor. It, we, um, we had a ca working cafe, we, had, uh, we commissioned artworks, we commissioned a poetry anthology that was written half by um, Caribbean poets, half by Scottish poets on the subject of Scotland and the the North Atlantic slave trade, we commissioned short stories, we had um, lots of discussions and events, music, all about this subject and we had over I think 4,000 people that came through the door and um, when you do these things, when you're getting funding, they always ask you what, is one, what, what do you think um, the risks are and one of the risks of course was that people just might not like it, you know, they might get very offended and but uh, we felt it was important to do it in the year of the Commonwealth Games to explore empire and to explore those connections and also of course as we came up to our vote for a referendum to look at ourselves in this way and uh, we weren't scared of offending people we, didn't, we weren't going out to offend people but this is a history that we have to look at and I would, we got I think over 4,000 people through the door we had great discussions really great discussions and it just reaffirmed to me that people are willing and, and uh, eager to talk about this. Our last debate was Scotland colonised or colonisers and we had over 300 people and it, it was a great discussion. Okay, Louise, uh, thank you very much for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up so that we can get a few very, very brief questions to the uh, panel. If you would like to ask a question, could you raise your hand um, and once I acknowledge you, keep your hand up until we get the microphone either lit up in front of you or indeed a microphone will come to you. Um, the gentleman just to my right, yes. 
Right. Okay. Wait a minute. Get, get on. Right. Yeah. Hello. Oh. <laughs> right. You don't have to do anything. Just Hello. Speak. Right. Um, <clears throat> I was part of my course last year was studying the history of the uh, foundation of the uh, Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Um, and it was, you know, it was originally in, in what's in Fermanagh Street, they're heading down to high school yards, and there was the medical school and the surgical hospital, Drummond Street, and all that. What I found out in doing that was that there's a, a Dr. Patterson or Dr. Palmer um, sent a, a donation of £400 from Jamaica to the foundation of the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary with an apology saying he couldn't afford any more as he only had 12 slaves on his plantation. So this is, this is a relates to what you were saying, uh, 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 Dr. Jeffrey, about the, um, the power and the wealth. The other thing being, the, the, I couldn't find the, the, the providence of the name of the infirmary street based on it was the infirmary. Prior to being named infirmary street, it was named Jamaica Street. There's also another Jamaica Street in, down, down in uh, the new town. There's also Jamaica Street, which is now the NCP car park um, in, in Glasgow, just near Central Station. Um, so how much power and wealth did they have to, to, to enable the city fathers in Glasgow and Edinburgh to name a street after the, you know, the island in the West Indies and build massive houses? How much of the, the, the medical establishment in the 1700s was, was based on that? I think that's you know, an interest point. Comment, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I think it maybe comes into a wider area. I mean, we've talked about you know, the money coming uh, here for building the institutions and the like. Um, if it hadn't been for the slave trade, and I, I heard you alluding to um, England's industrial history was different for ours, if it hadn't been for that, the slave trade, if it hadn't been for the money coming in here, yeah, no, where would Scotland have been no, the, the, at that the thing, point? The thing is that, um, you know, that in a public lecture, especially when you're trying to cover the, the range of contributions mm. and, and new thinking that's come in, in this volume, inevitably you simplify. Mm. Now, the thing about it is this, the movement of an entire society from one rural base to a new industrial urban base is terribly complex. In other words, that feeding into the causes of the Scottish industrialization, I would say were at least a dozen prime variables. But one of the central ones was the question, how does a poor society, one of the poorest in Western Europe, managed to galvanize the capital resources required at least in the first stages of industrialism. Mm -hmm. Not right through the 19th century, but I would say to about the 1830s. And the, the, the two streams in my view to answer that question are one, what we've been talking about today, mm -hmm. the slave-based economies of the colonial Americas and the Caribbean. And secondly, and not to be underestimated either, especially given the reference that people have been making to to streets and uh, palatial houses, the Indian subcontinent. It's very important as well in terms of capital return and uh, monies being sent back and then people retiring uh, to this country. And don't forget, let's not forget the opium trade. One MacDrug who has come from Canton with a million of opium in each pocket mm. and bought Lewis in 1842 and was then knighted they used to give knighthoods away in those days. Really? Yeah, really. And now they're so hard there, aren't they, Tom they're, and Geoffrey? They're very, they're very, very rigorous to mm. use the term being used here. It's like lordships these days. Oh, no, no, I mean, <laughs> one would never accept one of those. Um, I mean, they are tarred and feathered, uh, especially given the most recent news, or what one might say, the most recent speculation. But cut that out now, cameraman. Now, yeah, thing, cut that out. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the thing about it is this. There's a disproportionate role for people from this country, especially at middle rank level, um, out there in the world. And a lot of what they make, and by, and by the way, many, many, many of them died. The American scholar who has put the, who's introduced this book for us, very distinguished historian of the Caribbean, has pointed out, from Johns Hopkins University in the USA, has pointed out one letter that he picked out from his files about a Scotch, Scottish merchant house saying, always send out three factors because two of them might be dead during the seasoning. So there was, there was, you know, it was a high-risk business. But because of this, I would say certainly distinctive, if not unique, 
disproportionate embrace that middle rank Scots had, professionals, merchants and, and, and the rest, with the world. Mm. Um, and that's what makes Scottish history, in a sense, or one of the things that makes it so fascinating to me, that you know, this very small country, tiny by any comparison, had this global effect. Mm. Jeff, you want to come in there? Yeah, if, if we look at, so take an example of um, a small town. I gave a lecture to the Royal College of Physicians recently, and I pointed out to them that their building was owned by Mr. Blackburn. And Mr. Blackburn uh, came from Killeer. You know, he's just near Glasgow, small, lovely little town. And Killeer was rebuilt by Mr. Blackburn. So he didn't only own the, 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 the building in which the Royal College of Physicians are in at Queen Street. He went to Jamaica, made a fortune, came back, and Killearn was, you know, in a very bad, bad way. He actually rebuilt Killearn. It, it is his town. I went to Killearn to have a look, and I found the local um, a library, and I looked it up, and it said, yes, Mr. Blackburn rebuilt Killearn, but, and he was a successful merchant. That's it. Mm. <laughs> and, and therefore... This is the sort of um, history. I don't think, in fact, I've lectured all over Scotland, and nowhere have I found any Scottish person, once they hear this history, their main comment has been, why haven't they told us this before? And those people who had the knowledge and the authority and did not tell the people before 2007 are responsible. And they're responsible in a, in, a, in a very serious way because I deal with the Jamaica community. I'm Jamaican. And I've just spoken to the Jamaican people in London because it's of their independence. Seven of the Jamaican national heroes are Scots descent. And they weren't aware because this history wasn't in Longman's, the textbooks they were given. So we have a responsibility today to actually try not only and put that right, but also to recognize what we call the black Scottish diaspora, which were left out of the Burns celebration until we complained. Thank you. The gentleman with the check shirt, uh, two rows back, three rows back. Keep your hands up. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, Professor Ryan Devine, thank you very much for your usual erudite, informative and enjoyable lecture. Um, those who do not learn from history are forced to repeat it. While it is sad that 3.2 million people were enslaved during the time of the transatlantic slave trade, it does actually pale into insignificance almost with the latest UN figures on child slavery in 2014, which at a conservative estimate, number 36 million children. I just wonder if, is there any lesson to be learned from the uncovering of Scotland's involvement in the earlier slave trade that might be applied to eradicating the current slave trade? So, so, yeah. well, I mean, as you say, rightly, the magnitudes are quite different. But on the other hand, the possibility of controlling that magnitude are also greater because a global authority like the UN should be, you know, at the forefront of doing that. In the UK in the late 18th, early 19th centuries, despite many obstacles, um, the abolitionist movement eventually succeeded. Um, we've been talking very much about the realities of the iniquities of slavery, but the other side of it was, was that it was eventually defeated. And I think in the same way, although evil can never be entirely eradicated, the, the horror that you've talked about it could certainly be dealt with to a much more significant and muscular extent if there was international will to do it. And if you want to see will in action against vested interest, both moral, philosophical, and religious, 
in aspects of the abolitionist dynamic in the 19th century in Britain um, and then of course the campaign against slavery in the USA uh, during and after the Civil War these are, these are good lessons these are good lessons for you because it demonstrates the fact it can be done Ok, I'm going to take that lady and I'm going to take the gentleman there and um, I'll let everybody sum up then Lady here um, it's just a point about people being treated unjustly. Usually when people are treated unjustly, the victims themselves speak up. You know, if women want a more equal position, women speak up. And if the Irish feel that they're not getting treated properly in Scotland, they speak up as the descendants of the Irish. But we're in a situation in Scotland where black people who were enslaved were not here to speak for themselves. I would just be interested in people's comments on yeah, that. That's, uh, okay. that's actually one of the main arguments in the, the Lost to History chapter I, I referred to. Um, because there's the, the question of comparison. Why is it in England that this has got such high profile and has done since the 1960s, 1970s? I think one answer to it is the different demographies. You know, that uh, if, even if you take London and leave out the rest of England, there is a very considerable Afro-Caribbean population in the capital. That population has contributed some very articulate artists, writers, dramatists, and indeed also historians. And certainly my English colleagues tell me that one of the reasons why the museums in England have, been, have been, had to radically alter their displays, and one of the reasons for the success of the 2007 collaboration, uh, commemorations has been a dynamic uh, West Indian population, descent population, south of the border. Whereas in Scotland, although I think there are clear signs now of a fair amount of activism from that demographic background, that um, even in relation to our Pakistani and Indian neighbours, the West Indian population is relatively minuscule compared to its proportionality in the English population. It's not the only factor, but I think you put your finger on one of, the, one of the elements, because I know that some of the West Indian activists today from that background, including Geoffrey, that they are, they are now articulating loudly and clearly why this needs to be paid attention to. David. I would have to say in this, um, Glasgow is, is leading the way. Um, of Geoffrey Palmer has been doing admirable work for a, a long number of years. But in Glasgow um, as well, we have Graham Campbell, uh, who's involved with African Caribbean Centre, African Caribbean Culture. Well, listen to the name, um, Graham Campbell. Scottish, English, Jamaican, oh. but also the, co with dreadlocks. <laughs> yeah. dreadlocks, uh, the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, formerly GARA. Uh, have been a strong voice on Scotland's involvement with slavery for a long number of years. And in fact, that was how I started the research in 2007 into this area. You know, so they, 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 there have been voices you know, from the black community. Um, so, so certainly, um, there is now a cacophony of voices. You know, this is growing. Geoffrey, would you like to add something to that? Yes, yeah, so just to the gentleman there so we don't leave him out. Mm. And you were talking about the modern slavery. And I absolutely agree with you. I think it's awful that people should be treated, um, you know, with their rights taken away. But I've always said to my students, it, it doesn't do us any good to compare evils <laughs> because it is usually used to then ignore one evil. And I think each evil should be addressed separately and the consequences of that evil. And we have the consequences in the Caribbean in terms of poverty, etc which we are responsible for in terms of what we've done. So I, I quite agree with you and something should be done. The, one of the differences is that the, the evil which we're talking about here was legal. And it's another lesson for us. We must not legalize evil because then it allows bad people to say it's okay. And just finally, in terms of people, we are talking about the diaspora you're absolutely right if somebody is agitating. But I feel that good people should recognize, no matter who they are, are wrong when it's there. You don't need the victim to tell you that it's wrong. Because if the victim is voiceless, then you'll do nothing. 
But I think, I've got a letter here, just one second. And I taught at the Harriet Watt for 30 years. And I was looking through a box five years ago. And I found this letter in a box at the Harriet Watt University at Rickerton. Nobody had seen it since 1838. I, I took it out and I looked at it and I saw two numbers, 96 and 93. It is that what made me look at it because all historians about slavery know the, the vote. In Parliament, one of the votes for, for abolition was 96 to 93. So these two numbers attracted my attention. I then read it. This document was the Rickerton was the home of the Gibson Craig in 1838. And this is Gibson Craig MP writing to his father at Rickerton after the vote, which one of the votes for abolition. And just one sentence in this letter, which I've given to the university, and I'll have it, and I'll leave a copy, anybody wants it. He writes to his father and he talks about the politics of the vote. And what he says, over 500 MP, only 90, was it 180 odd turned up. They weren't going to vote for it. But the one statement phrased in this letter, which is important for all of us, it says to his father, despite all the politics, whatever, I voted for abolition and I will do it again. And to me, if there's a lesson, it's not about what other people make us do, is what we ourselves feel is right and should be done. Um, final brief question for the gentleman in the front. Mention in the debate and discussions of Jamaica, um, I'm actually part of an organisation called Flag Up Scotland Jamaica with Graham Campbell that is trying to highlight the links both negative and positive between Scotland and Jamaica um, and we're in the Scottish Parliament. Is there a case, um, given the fact that there are countries such as Malawi, uh, Canada, New Zealand, which are priority countries for the Scottish Government in terms of trade and in other areas, that Scotland, Scotland actually has stronger links to Jamaica, so is there a case that Jamaica should be a priority country for the Scottish Parliament? Well, the Scottish Parliament itself, as opposed to the Scottish Government, we have got um, a relationship with Malawi. Um, it is the only country that we've got a direct relationship with, um, and we support them as parliamentarians, and we support the country as well as that. And that goes back, of course, to the um, David Livingston connection. Um, it's for the Scottish Government to determine its own priorities, but if you wish to take forward the relationship between the Parliament and Jamaica, you might want to get in touch with some of the MSPs and suggest that, for example, they set up a cross-party group um, on Scotland and Jamaica. Uh, there's also other alternatives, and that is that you, know, you could encourage, for example, um, some of the MSPs to put down motions and we can have members' debates on the subject. So there's a number of ways that you can engage with the Parliament uh, to get wider recognition, uh, but we can't support financially, um, whereas you know, the, the government, in terms of their trade, they've got their own priorities, but you know, there is nothing, uh, th th there's nothing that we can't do in here, um, provided that you engage with the MSPs and we can you know, make sure that these cross-party groups are set up to allow much, much greater discussion. Okay? Right, can I thank you all very much for your question. We're now about seven minutes over and I get a row for never keeping to time. Um, <laughs> wouldn't happen when I'm up in that chair, that's for sure. Um, but anyway, um, just before I thank uh, the panelists, I just wonder if each of you would like just a couple of sentences just to um, sum up your thoughts. And I'm going to start with uh, Geoffrey first and work through Louise and uh, Stephen and then of course we'll let Sir Tom have the last word. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> well what I'd like to do is to thank the, the, the Scottish Parliament for setting up this um, uh, meeting um, to today and, and I think that um, as far as I'm concerned 
one little story sums it up. The most senior Rastafarian in Jamaica came to Scotland quite recently, and we were having a coffee, and I said, you know, and I was telling him about the Scottish history and links with Jamaica, and he said, well, it's nothing to do with him. He's, his name is Yasu Safari. And I looked at him because I'm Jamaican, and I can look at a Jamaican and tell his links, genetically. So I looked at him and I said, Yasu, what's your father's name? And he stopped for a minute, very Jamaican, and he says, why? Because I know his name is Yasser Safari. I said, I just want to know your father's name, Yasser. He said, it's thing clear, so what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, please. Um, well, I think Flag Up Jamaica uh, are doing a great, a great project, really. And I guess, for me, I would like the next homecoming not only to look towards Canada and Australia and America, but also to turn towards the Caribbean and to uh, welcome and acknowledge our brothers and sisters there because we are related and there are things that we can do in terms of culture, but also actually good hard educational links because I think we're due to pay some kind of reparation and education seems to me a very good way forward. That was actually my final question. <laughs> that was actually going to be my final point to Sir Tom, but you have already started to address it, so I'll, I'll let Stephen and, and Tom do it as well. And the question really is, I mean, you know, we're now getting uh, this uh, wonderful work coming out of the universities, but how long do you think it's going to percolate before it percolates down to our schools mm -hmm. and that we're actually getting taught at there. You know, are we talking 10 years, 20 years, and what do you think should be done to make sure we don't? Stephen, I'll let you come in first. Schools in particular, yeah, schools do you want me to sum up? Yes, yeah, sum up, but sum you know, well. yep, yep. Well, I'm delighted as a research historian, you know, I'm delighted to see, you know, this work that's underway. It's, it's really exciting for me to be part of something. You know, you can see it as having a, as a tangible change. For me, there's two questions. What did Scotland give to Caribbean slavery? And what did Caribbean slavery give to Scotland? You know, so we know the Scots are involved all over. Uh, the next level of analysis that has to be done, how much of these fortunes were made and how much it came back. What Caribbean slavery then gives to Scotland, we need to quantify an objective, serious analysis to see the impact. You know, much more work needs to be done in this. You know, but you raise the important point is, is, is how does this percolate into, into society? At the, our project on Runaway Slaves, we're, I study the, the black community in, in Great Britain uh, in the 18th century. So what, a big part of our project is um, public engagement and knowledge exchanging with schools you know, and teachers. Back. So, so we're already uh, ahead of the game on that. Um, but we know that Scots in Scotland profited for this, so yeah, the reparations point. There has to be some form, of, uh, you know, reparations can come in many different forms, but there has to be a serious debate um, surrounding this uh, and eventually reconciliation. Tom? Well, I think the problem, of, yeah. pr the problem about reparations is that um, we can't simply talk about Jamaica. We've got the whole of the Caribbean and perhaps some other parts of the world, mm. including the Indian nations of Canada and Aboriginal peoples in Australia. So I, 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 personally, I wouldn't want to go down that route. But at the, route I've always, um, the route I've always preferred is a recognition, awareness recognition, and also the lamentable fact that despite pleading from a certain quarter, at the last year of homecoming, the official invitations did not go out to the Caribbean peoples. I think that was an error on the part of the government. I hope it will not be repeated next time. And the second, the second thing is um, looking at the Commonwealth Games with some of those delectable um, third generation divines. Papa, why are those runners from that country, why are they all called Scottish names? That gave me another interest in this and an impetus to get, get the work done. The book is designed to appeal widely. Uh, please read it and remember it is meant to shock. <laughs> okay. Uh, on that point, can I ask you to join me in thanking uh, our panel, Sir Jeff Palmer, uh, Louise Welsh, Stephen Mullen.
Thank you all very much. And of course, I'm sure you would like to thank Professor Tom Devine for his absolutely fascinating, interesting, stimulating, thought-provoking... <laughs> It's getting good, isn't no, it? No, you just keep... Debate. Thank you. Thank you. Don't stop, don't stop. The great, the great thing about uh, doing this job is that you get to meet people and talk to people that you've admired for many, many years. And I have admired uh, Sir Tom Devine for more years than perhaps... I would like to think. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so Tom will, of course, be down in the garden lobby signing the books uh, for the fun for his grandchildren. <laughs> will you please come down and join us because we are launching the Festival of Politics. There's music and there's fun. Uh, so join us in our uh, great garden lobby. Can I also remind you that there's a screening of 12 Years a Slave at half past seven tonight in the members' room. There's a few tickets left and they're available from the ticket desk in the cafe bar. So on that point, can I invite you once again to come and join me and ask you just to say thanks again to our panel. <laughs>